So we are live here, the CMAS Q&A with Mike Pantile and myself today. Tim and Nick are busy in the uh, debate world. Tim speaking with our friend Rolo Tomasi about the red pill. So that'll be fascinating to catch up on. We wish them best of luck. And today, rather than crack on with the seventh commandment, which would have been the plan if we had the whole crew here, we're just going to be taking some questions. So drop those into the comments whenever you like. Mike and I have got some questions already to go. So Mike, not sure if you've got any particular ones that you want to start off with, but let's just get into them straight away. I've got a pretty interesting one. So question is how to live a proper Catholic life with no proper Catholic churches nor people around you. And my first thought with that was, is there really not a single Catholic church within driving distance? It'd be pretty rare if that's the case. Like normally you can find one. Yeah, that's that's my question too. Maybe this person lives in a particularly rural area, but even still, if, if that was me in that position, I would be driving 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it took each way um, to find that that parish. I can't imagine, um, especially with the amount of Catholics that exist in the world, that there isn't a, a parish within driving distance. Um, mm. So figure that out first. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the, the world's largest Christian denomination by a long way. So normally you're not ever too far from a Catholic church. But if you're just living out in the middle of nowhere, then you can look at the lives of some of the saints who did the same thing. There's plenty of hermits in the history of the church. So you can live a holy life, but you really want to be going to mass and be part of a community and get that support because it just helps to strengthen you in all kinds of ways. Next question I had, there was a pretty interesting one too. Mike, this is one that's dear to our heart. How to inspire my husband to lift? I'm really struggling with physical attraction. Well, first up, mm -hmm. I want to say well done for actually seeking help with that rather than just letting it bottle up inside you and grow really resentful. But Mike, what should a wife do if she's thinking the husband's not really taking care of physical fitness and not being an inspiring leader in that way? Um, I know it would work for me and some guys may not agree with it necessarily, but I would want my wife to actually sit me down and talk to me about that and just be honest with, with me about it. You know, um, maybe shaming tactics don't work. They would certainly work on me because I would get my, my shit in order pretty quickly. Um, uh, but I think, an, you know, praying in silence, of course, that's the, the biblical view of anything like that when your husband's not, um, you know behaving as he should or not honoring his, his, his body or the marital debt or what have you. Um, but have a, a, an honest conversation. It's not going to change unless you actually, uh, you know, attack it head on. I think in this case, it's communication is key. Don't just send him Instagram reels or posts from one of your favorite creators. That's not going to do anything. Uh, and, and honestly, with men, we oftentimes need to be bludgeoned over the head with the truth. I tell my wife, like, let's say we're having a little, you know, uh, back and forth um, or she's dealing with something. I'll get her to say, hey, listen, do you need me to solve this problem or do you want me to just listen? I need to know. So I would say have a conversation with him. Be honest. Mm, yep. I think that's what right. You, man? What do you think? Yeah, I would echo your thoughts. I get asked this question quite a lot. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. I get asked this question a lot. And <clears throat> I think that wives need to do exactly what Mike says and say how they're feeling. And the earlier you do that, the better. Otherwise, you can end up with this building into a problem that lasts years and over a decade, then you can end up with a dead bedroom because of this stuff. So the husband should be taking care of physical fitness and health, just like the wife should be. It's about self-respect. It's about honoring God. It's also about honoring each other. And mm -hmm. if you're finding that that attraction is going because of this, let him know ASAP. And you can even tell him that you just find some of the habits or behavior traits you're seeing uh, turnoffs put it like that don't be harsh about it just be honest and clear and say that you're saying this out of love and you want him to make the changes and you're going to make them with him as well and support him etc this isn't you framing yourself as the leader in the marriage it's just you pointing out that you've got potential problems what do you think mike yeah no i i absolutely uh agree with that and also too i mean there's no greater motivator for men man than than sex and just be honest with them in that way it's like hey listen like i want to have sex with you i want to be like maximally attracted to you you know if you, if you did this it's not that you know 
you're not trying to negotiate sex. You should always honor the marital debt. But hmm. guys want enthusiastic intimacy too. It's not just like, you know, being a paper patriarch and demanding that obedience from your wife. It's, you know, do something that inspires that attraction too. And so Hell I think yeah. that sex being a motivator is going to be pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you just tell the guy that you're finding his behavior boyish or effeminate. And for most guys with normal personalities, that's going to be everything they need to get their act together and start being more masculine because they want to please their wives. No man in his right mind, like Mike says, wants just duty sex. Like in principle, yeah, of course, you still got to, you're still his wife, but that's not really going to satisfy his heart. He wants to actually see that look of desire in your eyes. So anything he can do to achieve that, if he's a normal guy, that's going to motivate him big time. Absolutely true. And and so I think to pass a certain level of physique as well. And, you know, my wife is back with this as well, because she's, she's, you know, used to just me being in shape all the time. She'll even say that it's more so the act of, of being disciplined and hitting milestones. It's not so much like the number on the bar or how big your pecs are past a certain point. It's the behavior that's fundamentally attractive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Women don't care whether you bench 450 or 380. They don't even think about it. So it's just about the it's just about the fact that you just show up and put work in, and you know when I was getting sacked, I was pretty stressed a lot of the time and worried about stuff, but I still just kept going to the gym and plodding along, even though I wasn't setting PRs or even lifting particularly heavy. Sometimes I just go there and do not a lot at all, just a few warm up sets, but going through the motions because it's better than sitting around moping. And you know my wife respected the fact that I kept the train on the tracks. That's absolutely right. And you know, it's funny. It's absolutely true that they don't care what, what weight is on the bar. Cause my, I'll tell my wife, Hey, I hit whatever 700 for five or whatever. And she's, Oh yeah, that, that, that's great. I'm like, don't you realize and she, <laughs> it past, past a certain point <laughs> and I'm being, I'm, I'm joking, but yeah, it's literally just a, a sign of progress. She couldn't care less if it's 405 or 700 or 800. She's just like, I'm just numb to it at this point. Like, good job, honey. I'm like, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, we got, we got a comment from uh, Mike's wife. Hello, father-in-law. Yep, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's me. The rumor is that Mike is the product of my love child with a forklift truck, which uh, <laughs> ex explains the stratospheric deadlift. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious rumor. I, w I haven't been fornicating with the forklift. Um, now we've Thank got... <laughs> Next one, Mike's pretty cool, actually. Um, how do I be in uni or a job without any white lies is it even possible in today's society hmm what do you think that's a good one man i think so what he's implying here um is is maybe working for a corporation that's woke who's got some of these like yeah more skittles like values um i think there are sins by commission and sins by omission and i personally think if 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 it doesn't sit right with you and you're sitting there and you're kind of putting it on the face and you're going through whatever they're doing, you know, LGBT, whatever courses now and, and whatnot. Honestly, I would just try to find a, a respectful way out. Don't just quit the job and, you know, try to find something when you're unemployed. It's always easier to find a job when you're employed. But I would quickly try to find an alternative because t in my opinion, and Will, I could be wrong about this. I, th I do think that's a sin by omission, in my opinion. Yeah. So <clears throat> you can't ever lie. That's immoral. It's contrary to natural law because the purpose of your speech is to communicate truth. But you don't always need to say the truth to everyone in all circumstances. You can just keep silent. So what I mean by that is you don't have to fight every single battle that's there. You have to just pick the principle, the place, and think about the purpose of it as well. Because it might be more useful to your institution and to your family, your future. If you don't get yourself into the maximum amount of trouble, like sometimes a fight's yep. going to come for you and you have to meet that and you might get sacked over it, but you don't need to be some kind of douchebag who's always trying to be as adversarial as possible over everything that's political and likely to get him in trouble. Speak the truth, but know when to hold your tongue too. Yeah. You got to choose which hill, um, you want to die on. I was it used to be one of those guys that'll die on every hill and you quick, quickly exhaust yourself and you just, you alienate yourself as well. I think praying for wisdom and discernment in which battles you should fight um, is, is proper because you can't fight 
everyone. And when, and, and if you do, if you do engage, engage respectfully and tactfully, especially as a person uh, of faith, if you're a Catholic, if you're a Christian, um, people are going to be looking at you through a microscope. They're going to be analyzing your behavior closely, more closely than if you weren't a believer. Um, and so be a good representation of Christ in your way that you communicate in any of those altercations, for sure. Yeah, that's it. And if you look at Christ in the Gospels, he's not always trying to get into petty debates with people, rarely debates at all. He just is measured in his speech and tries to get along with people, speaks the truth and doesn't get bogged down in thumb wars on social media like so many guys do. I can't imagine him being on Twitter, just constantly replying, say, well, actually, and just starting fights in the comments wherever he goes. I don't think that's a good use of a man's time. There's plenty of other things that we can be doing that help the world more. Absolutely so agree. Here's another question we got. I'm a school teacher preparing for marriage. That's good. Where I live, I don't make serious money from it. I know I make a difference in education, but should I get a manlier job and pay to be a married man? What are you thinking, Mike? Hmm. Pay to be a married man. What is that? I, I'm not sure what he means by that. Maybe my, my brain is, is slow. Um, making a difference, having a purpose is important. But I think the thing is here, because there's not enough context, if you're not making enough money to have your wife at home, then I would look for alternative means of employment, personally. Um, mm -hmm. That's because, I mean, at, at that point, I mean, you're you're in a feminist marriage. And if you really want to be that patriarchal, godly man that we we, we always talk about, if I was in this, this position and I couldn't support my family on that, and, you know, we really had to, I mean, well, there's a balance between sacrificing lifestyle in order to support your family. But if you're really barely making ends meet, find a different job, 100%. Yeah, I agree with that. If you're really struggling to provide the necessities financially, then you want to look at upgrading the job. However, most of the time, it's just about living more frugally. Like there are guys with stay-at-home wives on 50K a year. Yep. You can do it if it's your true top priority. So I don't know what you mean by serious money. Like, is it that you want to make six figures? If teaching is your vocation and that's what the gifts that God has given you suit you for and you're doing his work, then I would err on the side of sticking with it, trusting in providence and the fact that God's the ultimate provider for your family rather than trying to ditch it, go into the corporate world, thinking that it's the number in the bank account that matters most of all, because you might end up working twice the hours you are right now and have a worse situation in your home life. So that's a difficult one. It depends on what you mean by serious money. But we've given you the principles for you to be able to think around that anyway. All right, next one. Always the interesting one, Mike. Left my family in faith for Catholicism, <clears throat> how do I still honor my parents, but deny my family traditions and my grandfather? Ooh, man, that's a tough one. I mean, if it's in my mind, and I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty extreme guy. In my mind, if 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 they don't want to compromise on some degree, and they say, hey, you must participate in these traditions you're Catholic, we don't care. I would cut my family off. That's just, you know, that could be what the calling truly is. You know, if you're, if this, let's say whatever, you know, ideology they prescribe to, let's say they're Muslim and they're trying to force you to participate and you're a Catholic and it's fundamentally incompatible with your worldview, I would just cut them off. That's, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about, you know, either being in an eternal paradise or within the gates of hell. And so to me, it's like, I, there's no price you can put on that and you can't compromise your faith. Jesus speaks very clearly about those that are lukewarm. He spits them out of the, his mouth. So stay hot. It's it's hard. St st remain within your convictions and cut them off if you truly need to. It's it's difficult, but the that's part of the walk too. Mm -hmm. yep. you say? Yeah, yeah. Christ said he came to bring a sword, <clears throat> separate brother from brother, son from father, etc. And sometimes that happens. In general, I don't recommend that people be the one to bring the wall down on their side. I think it's much better that you just speak the truth, live it, let them see it. And if they cut you out, then that's fine. 
they're doing something that's for your own spiritual benefit then because they're signaling they're a threat to you because they've taken a stand uh, against the church but like mike says live in the truth and then accept the consequences because what else are you going to do live a lie that's not good that's well said well i would say yeah keep it on them to to cut you off don't be the one to just sever all ties um but if you're trying to reach a compromise and they're like nope we're gonna excommunicate you from the family then so be it this this yeah. walk comes with a price yeah that's it you know if i've got any family or friends talking new age pagan hippie nonsense around my kids i'll just tell them you can't tell my kids that stuff not on my watch like i don't want any of that don't make jokes about anything to do with catholicism it's disrespectful don't teach them all this false nonsense about sexual morality and if you carry on doing that i'll just get stricter and stricter with it we won't be coming to these events etc and most of those people eventually they're just going to cave and then not want to spend time with you anymore and that's their problem and they can't take the heat of having someone who actually challenges them because they just want it to be that no one really cares about what opinions you hold, um, except ironically, they do really hate anything to do with Catholicism. So just teach your kids that there's the double standard there. They pretend to be tolerant, but actually they're very intolerant. That's very well said. I got a good one here, man, that uh, I've... I've I've had repeatedly, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. What would you do if your adult daughter did not want to live at home until marriage? As in over 18? Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> she's over 18, right? So doesn't have to obey you. You've done mm -hmm. a bad job as a father if that's her attitude. So first of all, you want to be mad at yourself for not actually explaining to her what the benefits of that are. But yeah, after age 18... You don't get to click your fingers and have her do everything you say. I still think you should caution her about the dangers that it might involve. So you've done your duty as her protector as far as you can. Just say, here are the likely pitfalls if you're going to move out right now. But you've messed up if you got to that point and she's just saying, you know, screw you, dad. I don't believe in your advice. Um, now I'm 19. I'll do whatever I want. Yeah, I completely agree with this. You really got to plant those seeds early on before that age and and not be the passive lukewarm father. Um, I get this question a lot. Would you allow your daughter to go to college or university or live on her own? Um, well, if she got to that point, 18, 19, 20, I knew it was a failure on my part that she even desired those things. And so have those conversations early on. And let's say hypothetically that did happen. I knew, number one, that's my failure. But number two, I would still sit her down and, and speak with her about it and really lay out in a you know kind, loving way um, the pros and cons. And But the hope would be to plant those seeds early on, foster a loving environment within the home that she didn't never really wants to leave. Feel like she's got some level of freedom without being disobedient. But if she's 18 plus and she wants to do it, that's on you, unfortunately. it's it's That's a, that's a harsh reality, but that's the truth. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and you can take the stance as well that, you know, after she's 18, then she wants to go live that life and it's going to involve providing for herself financially too. It's a lot of pressure that's suddenly going to come down on her because if she wants to go and do this outside the house and no longer has a duty to obey you, then strictly speaking, you haven't got the same duty to provide for her at that age as you did when she was age eight. So just Correct. have that big talk about the fact that it's about to get hard, fast, and this is a very abrupt transition from having everything there for you in the comfort of the home to basically having to fend for yourself. And I think in a lot of cases, it's just about the grass being greener and the lack of impulse control that teenagers have generally and girls probably have especially. And it's your job to try and talk her through that, but... First of all, focus on the fact that you failed to lay that foundation properly. Bang on. Mike, here's one. Is it possible to be a Catholic hyper-masculine man? If yes, <laughs> how? So I don't even want to be a hyper-masculine man. Is that one of your goals when you wake up in the morning, Mike? Uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I have my rosary in my hand and I'm praying. It's like, Lord Jesus, grant me the strength to be a hyper-masculine man. Yeah, I don't even... <laughs> No, I, I, I don't think that's that should be the goal. I think 
if you're if you're trying to be hyper masculine, I would say that there's probably other uh, deficiencies within your personality or the way that you live your life that you, your your uh, your priorities are mis misaligned. Um, I want to be a man that embodies, you know, biblical virtue, and and to embody you know, Christ in the way that he lived as much as I possibly can while honoring my body, you know, in terms of physical strength, feeding it well, you know, leading my, my, my family with authority. Um, but being hyper masculine, yeah, that's, that's not the goal. You know, it used to be the goal, but that was when I was a degenerate and you mm -hmm. know, what came from that nothing. And you know, what's really funny about that pursuit of trying to be hyper masculine, you become hyper effeminate. You care about your abs showing all the time. You care about all of this female attention. You want to fornicate. Yeah, it's 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 a feminine behavior. There's nothing hyper masculine about that. Maybe according to the world standards, but Andrew yeah. Tate may answer differently. But yeah, yeah, exactly. First up, I don't know what hyper masculine means. Uh, you can argue that homosexuality is a kind of hyper masculinity because. They have the ultra promiscuous, no strings attached lifestyle. They often have really high disposable incomes because they got no kids to provide for. They can travel mm -hmm. the world easily. They got nothing tying them down to a particular place. They take lots of risks. So are you asking if you can live like a homosexual? <laughs> Arguably, yeah. I, I don't think hyper masculinity should be the goal. I think just obeying God's commandments should be the priority. And then your masculinity takes care of itself as a byproduct mm -hmm. of that. And humility is a big part of that. I always get really suspicious whenever I see guys talking about themselves being alpha or hyper masculine or anything like that. I've never in my life walked up to a new guy that I'm meeting and just shook his hand and been like, hey, I'm Will. Um, I'm an alpha. Like, <laughs> no, no one talks like that, right, Mike? I, it's, it's just like this fantasy thing on the internet. Imagine introducing yourself to someone, like describing yourself as hyper masculine. Yeah, I think if you have to also say that you're hyper masculine or you're alpha, you're absolutely beta. Al yeah. al you know, we've both been around true alpha males, and they don't have to announce it. Like, their presence, it's yeah. unspoken. It's just we're hierarchical creatures in that way. What I th find is really interesting is the Sigma male label. Have you heard about that one, that Will? Yeah, I've heard that term. Talk people through it. Is, is that Vox Day? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure where, where it, it came from necessarily. I know it's been a, a term since like the internet, you know, has exploded. In the man I think it's probably closely related to the manosphere. But the Sigma male is higher in status than the alpha but he's a lone wolf and it's just it's very contradictory you're like well how how are you how do you have any status at all if there's no pack to tend to or to lead i find mm -hmm. it very interesting it's like guys that are on reddit or they're streamers and they're just like in their mom's basements trying to make themselves feel better about their decisions <laughs> yeah that's right <clears throat> yeah I, I really like that point about how the guys with genuine presence don't have to announce it i can remember being at some of the big powerlifting competitions and when you get some of the guys who are in the 275 class uh when they walk in even to like a big hall you can feel it and they're not yeah. loud like everyone respects them and they're just really nice guys that are quiet and humble but they don't even have to speak you can feel they're there yeah it's really really interesting i've been to a lot of powerlifting meets <laughs> coached competed the strongest guys are usually the most quiet I remember this being at this meet and there was this 198 gentleman. He actually broke my Canadian national record. Shout out to Mike Watson. And he was just sitting there and he, he was 200 pounds jacked out of his mind. No ammonia, no caffeine. He's just sitting there in between attempts, like with his daughter, his headphones on. And he outlifted everybody. Just every, just like just completely silent and went and just destroyed the competition. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's alpha male presence. It's mm. all actions, no words. Yep. You know, there's that old video. We're getting into too many powerlifting things here, but there was a, <clears throat> there's a video of Mike Tashere, who's a really humble guy, yeah. Christian too, very accomplished powerlifter and coach. And <clears throat> I've forgotten the number. It was some big, big deadlift, over 800. And um, he, he made it. He'd been working at it for years. And he didn't shout or do anything afterwards except just gently walk up to the weights and give them a pat. And then walked away. That was it. Oh, like, uh, who knows how many years of effort went into that? And he wasn't walking around pointing the finger at the people he'd beaten. It was just about him and the weights. That was it. 
That's what, yeah, dude, Mike Tashir is great. That's what I love about the Russian, the Russian lifters. It's business. They show up, it's a little bow and they walk out after just completely wiping the floor with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Nice way to do it. Okay, mm-hmm. Mike, this is going to get controversial now. Oh, geez. Do either of you do dishes? I have a dishwasher. I got an appliance for that stuff and my kids have all got a rotor where they have to load it. So the machine does the dishes and different day of the week, a different kid clears up dinner, loads the machine and unloads it. So it pretty much takes care of it. But if there's a pan or something, which has got some like already crusted on lasagna or, you know, something that the machine hasn't got off and my wife's busy breastfeeding or whatever, and the kids can't out muscle it, I'll do it. I've got no problem with that. But in general, there's a rotor that the kids take care of. What are you thinking, Mike? Oh, I have to, because everybody calls me a misogynist, I have to just, it begs this joke. I have a dishwasher. Her name is Karen Pantile. <laughs> <laughs> no, real real talk. I'm not above any duty in the in the home. The thing is, we too have a dishwasher, which is great. Um, and I, of course, would never mind helping my wife if she was doing something, breastfeeding the kids or whatever. Our kids are not of age where they can help with that yet, uh, like you will. Um, she doesn't like when I do them. So she prefers to do them. So I generally don't. I want to help her out. I'm not above changing diapers or whatever, but she does it way better than I do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave her to it. I'll try to help and she appreciates it, but she likes to do it her way and she does it way better. So yeah, yeah. I think that's that's uh, a hyper masculine answer. Will (laughs) I think it is though, Mike, because you're not fragile. You don't mind doing it. You're not, you're not one of the guys who's going to just do one dish and then have to run into the bathroom and check your testosterone levels. Yeah, that's right. Or inject myself <laughs> with the <top> <laughs> Exactly. Oh, great question. What can single women do to prepare to be a great wife and mother? What do you think, Mike? Oh, man. First of all, weaponize your chastity. Honor your chastity. Don't sleep with the man before marriage. If you want to weed out the, the good from the bad, I would say start with, with you know mentioning that straight away. Just get right down to business um, and look to look to scripture. What does it say about an honorable wife being the crown of her husband? What does St. Paul talk about in Ephesians um, about being obedient and submissive? Um, what does Peter say about, you know, praying in silence for her husband? And really, I mean, there's duties. There's things that you could work on learning how to cook properly and, and be clean and orderly. And honestly, I, I, I think the framework is really there in scripture, Proverbs 31, reading through Ephesians, Corinthians, it's all there. Um, and just seek to embody that as much as possible. Agreeableness, being pleasant, nurturing, kind, supportive, you know, encouraging, um, um, making the house into a home. Like I look at my my home and I, I say, man, this is all drywall that I purchased and wood. And my wife made it into a place that's comfortable. So, uh, I mean, look to scripture. That's, that's my, I guess, blanket answer. Yeah. That covers all the basics, I think. Up until age 18, you want to focus on obeying your parents and practicing being submissive there and being polite and agreeable, like Mike says, too, dressing modestly. And then Mm -hmm. you want to look to uh, Mary and the other female saints as well as really great models of what the cardinal virtues look like when they're lived out to the highest level by women. And you can just take right. some inspiration from their life stories too, because modern culture doesn't really give women many solid examples of that. You can't look to celebrities, for example, to see what mm-hmm. a shiny example of female virtue looks like. So you need to familiarize yourselves with the lives of the saints too. And that would be a great start. Um, is it too masculine for a woman to try martial arts and firearms my husband is my protector but i want to be an asset not a liability i have full confidence in him i think it's very masculine for a a woman to do martial arts i don't think there's a place where a woman should do martial arts i think uh women in combat sports are a sign of cultural decline um and let's face it like you if you as a woman if a man wants to do something to you Short of having a weapon, there's nothing that you can do. There's no level. In, and I know a lot of mixed martial artists and, uh, you know, some badass women 
Uh, no disrespect to them, but if that man is significantly heavier and stronger than you, he's going to impose his will upon you. Um, so I would say I absolutely object to martial arts. I used to be that guy that that was going to put his daughters into mixed martial arts, bro, and jujitsu. And now I I've completely gone back on that. Um, firearms. I think if you become like it's just like anything, right? I think it's the dose in this case that matters like with lifting yeah lift it's great it's good for a female body as well but taken too far it does become hyper masculine you kind of like tread that line of having like a tomboyish boyish hobby but if you're enjoying it with your husband and you're participating with him i don't think there's anything uh, wrong with that mm -hmm. yeah i'd agree it's like to mike's example of the lift in there it's there's pretty clear-cut evidence that it's healthier for women to do some resistance training than to do none like if you're looking to care for your wife's health and bone density as she gets older, et cetera, she should be doing a bit of lifting. The idea that she's just going to be a, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the trad wife skipping through the daisies, uh, greased up in beef tallow with the hobbit feet out, like Mike always <laughs> says, that's not going to, that's not going to keep her as healthy as doing some resistance training a couple of times a week. Like you might not like that fact, but it's true. So if you're that's interested right. in protecting her health, your wife should be doing a little bit of lifting. Um, don't take it too far though. And yeah, I would agree with Mike. I don't think the firearms with a little bit of just basic weapons training is as big of a problem as the martial arts. The reason I don't like martial arts is for women and for most guys, to be honest, it can actually be more dangerous in a street situation than not knowing any, because the guys yeah. who actually know what they're talking about, they'll just say, de-escalate, walk or run away. Like you don't want to get into a, into a fight on the street somewhere. And the, the women who've done a bit sometimes think they can handle themselves and there's delusion. It's dangerous to have that. So, you know, my daughters have never done any, uh, my wife's never done any, I wouldn't want to put them into that situation either. But if you're in a country where the laws allow women to handle guns, then they should know how to handle them safely in case you're out and there's a home invasion. Totally agree with that. I think that's a great point. Um, and, and, you know, with the lifting thing, it's really interesting. It's a, there's a perfect physiological or there's a perfect, yeah, physiological example. When a woman lifts too heavy and she gets too strong, I've seen it so many times where a woman will be lifting and she completely pees all over the platform. Mm -hmm. The pelvic floor is not meant to handle that. Now, I think martial arts generally a no, or most of the time a no go with weapons. I think that's the one place where, Hey, you want to learn how to defend yourself, have a weapon on hand enjoy it with your husband if i was into that i'd want my wife to enjoy it with me as well it's like it's bonding yeah and like you said that's the only thing have a natural force multiplier <clears throat> is the only yep. thing that's going to keep her safe in some situations so that's that learn to use it properly all right when i flirt with my girlfriend <clears throat> she says it's not true because of her low self-esteem should this bother me and he's got a follow-up to this well that we'll read too so the first one is she doesn't think the flirting is genuine. Should it bother him? Also, she says that she fears what if I met another girl better than her and she thinks this fear will never leave her. Should it leave her? Should I say I won't or just be quiet? Uh, that's an easy one to answer. Like if you are married and you have actually committed to her, and you guys don't believe in divorce, then she shouldn't be worrying about that. But you don't sound like you're married. You sound like you're just in a, a relationship. And that is always going to be making her feel anxious. And it's not a mentally good place for her to be in because you're probably not engaged either, right? So she knows deep down that you're not serious. So you need to take responsibility for the fact that she's just responding in a non-paranoid way to the signals that you've given her that actually you're on the fence about what she means to you. What do you think, Mike? No, that's absolutely true. I mean, if you've been dating her for four to six months, eight months, whatever, just marry her. A woman feels incredibly secure in that commitment, knowing that, you know, you, you know, you, you did what the Bible commanded you to do. And that was be, you know, leave and to cleave and to become one flesh with her. That'll give her that kind of security. Now, if she, if you guys are married, let's say hypothetically, and she's still struggling with that, there's a point where I think reassurance would help. But sitting down with the Bible and saying like, there's no amount of reassurance I could give you that'll make you feel this way or secure. Your security is knowing that we are honoring this marital covenant as this one flesh union under God. That's where security comes from. Whether it's finances, relationship, whatever. I'm not worried about any of that stuff 
because we're both honoring God and that's our commandment to do so. So if you guys aren't married, you guys are just in a boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, dude, there's no amount of reassurance you could give her that's going to make her feel that way. And 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 it's, there, there could be some subconscious signals that you're giving other women, you're giving her that uh, signifies a lack of commitment or lukewarmth on your part. It's not mm -hmm. enough context, but yeah. Yep, that's it. So often the <clears throat> the woman is like the mirror of the man's mindset and will also magnify it too. So you probably are actually uncertain about her and she's just picking yep. up on that and giving it back to you blown up bigger out of proportion because female anxiety is playing into it. Okay. How to avoid your children consuming degenerate media. If you're an adult who has to ask that question, you're not going to be able to stop your kids because you don't know enough about technology to be able to outwit them. They'll outsmart you every single time. If you don't understand how to use an app to block specific apps on your kid's phone or to set time limits, screen time, etc., then your kids are going to run rings around you. And the only situation I can think of for someone like that, uh, finding a solution to this would be for the kids not to have smartphones because the fact that you're asking the question uh, shows that you probably aren't going to be able to do it because your kids will know so much more than you. What do you think, Mike? I guess your kids are still pretty young, right? They're still pretty young, but in my mind, you know, when they become of age where there's no way to avoid technology and interacting with it, but I would, I am not going to be giving them smartphones or tablets early on. Like people really, you know, they, they outsource their parenting to these things. And then they wonder why their kids are consuming this media. It's because you're not, you're actually failing to protect them. So there's a couple things. Um, if they already are using tablets or smartphones, having blockers, like be, be, don't be so technologically ignorant. There are ways around this with every single app that, that exists, but also to its education, right? Like I'm not going to try to shield my daughters from everything. If there's a movie that has these particularly woke values, I'm going to sit down with her and we're going to watch it. And I'm going to explain to her why this is wrong. And it's that education piece versus saying, you just can't watch that. And my rule is, is my rule and that's it. Okay, granted, yeah, that is your authoritative position and you have a right to wield that. But I think education goes a really long way in them understanding the why. The do as I say, not as I, or do as I, yeah, say not as I do kind of thing. You know, that old school immigrant, just don't do it. It's not going to work. So phone blockers, you know, be ahead of the, the curve in terms of your mastery over technology. Uh, but I feel like if you have to ask this, you've already failed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, most most kids would be better off just not having a smartphone at all until they're pretty old. And then, yep. you know, even even now, my, my older teenage kids, I monitor their phones and just check up on uh, what's been happening over the week and make sure I've got blocks on all the social media apps so they can't get too sucked into it. And then that keeps things going pretty well. Uh, what's the biggest threat to Catholicism in 2024? same as it always is the devil basically the, the devil is the the ultimate threat and people love to try to pick out one particular group of people whether it's you know a particular ethnic group or whatever and say that's the evil and if we can just get rid of those guys everything will be fine no mm -hmm. it's a battle against the evil spiritual powers and you got to remember that and the, the devil is too great a foe for any of us to handle uh, without Christ's help. And like I've told a few people, um, you're not Batman. You're not out there to clean up Gotham by yourself as some kind of vigilante. That's delusional pride. Uh, the best thing you can do is just follow what the church teaches, stick to all the precepts, keep Christ's commands. And then that big threat is his to handle. It's not yours. You just have to arm yourself against it properly. Yeah, that's really well said, Will. And there's not much I would add to that besides part of my conviction in coming to Catholicism from Protestantism and being raised Roman Catholic was that there is a very, everybody hates the Catholic Church. Protestants hate the Catholic Church. Eastern Orthodox people don't like the Catholic Church, even though we're close in alignment. They don't like the, 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 the Catholic Church. Um, I don't see Eastern Orthodoxy getting attacked the way Catholicism does. I don't see Protestantism being attacked uh, the, the way that Catholicism is. Anytime I so much as mention it in my stories, you should see my DMs. You should see the amount of people that unfollow me. And so that was part of my conviction. I'm like, there's something very real here. Um, but really, it's it's to stand firm, just like you said, keep God's command. Don't waver. 
Don't become lukewarm. Don't become spineless. Stay bold in your faith. And the gates of hell can never prevail against the church, no matter who is sitting in St. Peter's chair. Mm -hmm. We're in a really weird time with, with Papa Francesco. Um, and it's an odd time to come to the church. Um, and I also think too, it just like it says, I think it's, it's in first Peter prepare a defense of your faith as well. I think we should all be armed with some basic level apologetics. Um, but you know, um, one could argue sometimes it's casting pearls before swine. That's a different conversation. Be bold, stand firm, act like a man, like St. Paul says in Corinthians. Yep. Good point. And makes me want to add devil number one number two probably weak catechesis guys having mm -hmm. a really weak knowledge of the rational foundations of the claims of the church so that they can't actually stand up for themselves when asked to give a defense and a lot of parents i think are responsible for having dropped the ball and then led to so many of the current generation not getting that solid education as they were growing up. And that led to a lot of people uh, leaving the church. Um, what good do you see coming out of wokeism? Not a lot, except for the fact that woke is ultimately the logical conclusion of secular liberalism, which is you do you, you're your own hero, you make your own meaning in life, um, maximizing your own autonomy and freedom is always your top priority. Once you've allowed those assumptions a foot in the door, the way is wide open to a man saying, well, I want autonomy from biology and it makes me happy to live as a woman. And for you to acknowledge that I truly am what I feel I am, which is a woman. So woke is just last stop on the crazy train that started with the dawn of the modern age around the enlightenment when Francis Bacon said that the essence of the project was about mankind becoming masters and possessors of nature. That was what the scientific quest to really dominate the physical world was about, reduce everything to numbers and formulas in maths and physics. But turns out that nature includes human nature too. And they really wanted to be able to become like gods, become their own creators, which I think is where we're heading now with transhumanism as the next frontier. And AI is the newest manifestation of that old delusion that Satan promised Eve in the garden that we can be as gods. And wokeism is going to make people who still have a bit of common sense left wake up to that fact and think, no, oh, we went wrong a few steps back because logically where we are right now comes from that. We need to retrace our steps and figure out what went wrong. Very well said. I think the only thing that's come that's good that's come from wokeism is the fact that it clearly, clearly shows how badly we need the church and how badly we need Christ's protection, because this is exactly um, what happens when atheism is thought out to a conclusion. It's a slippery slope of, of, of depravity and degeneration of, of society and culture. Um, and I mean, you're seeing it come to not come to a head. I think it's going to become very a, a lot worse, you know, with minor attracted people and transhumanism. There's no end game. Once Pandora's box is open, where is where are the boundaries? There are absolutely no boundaries that exist. And you've, you've seen this happen in the last sort of, you know, 100 years. It's been a slow decline. And now it seems like it's a lot more rapid to me. The only good thing that's come out of it is the clear, clear need for Christ in the world. Um, other than that, there's absolutely nothing that's good that's come from it. It's a cancer on society, and it's a malignancy masquerading as something that is virtuous and good in this form of love, when it's not about love at all. Um, it's narcissism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well put. Uh, love is about actually respecting reality and what's objectively good for someone. And affirming them in delusions is actually damaging them. So people yeah. need to let go of this idea that to be woke is just to be nice because niceness itself isn't something we should be pursuing at all costs. Uh, on that note, what to do? A colleague of mine is going to be gay married. I have not congratulated her on her engagement as others have. I don't want to be unkind 
but I don't want to endorse something that is wrong. Well, you would be being unkind if you endorsed it because that's spiritually damaging to her. I think you've taken the right course already, which is just holding your tongue and not giving approval to it. And hopefully you can just continue to do that. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, don't congratulate them. Don't show up to the wedding. And if you're confronted as to why you haven't shared congratulations, you're not going to the wedding. Uh, be kind. Don't be tactless and just, you know, throw slurs at them. But kindly explain as to why you don't actually think it is a legitimate marriage and why you haven't congratulated them and that your faith binds you to the truth and that you must always speak it because that is the loving thing to do. Pretty simple. Yeah, exactly. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said that the virtuous man will sometimes not shrink from bringing sorrow to those among whom he lives. And you just have to accept that sometimes that's the way it is. I got a funny one real quick before we get to the next one here. Yeah, yeah. Because I promised my wife. She said, can you ask my father-in-law about them, please? Dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and I engage in this, this conversation of dinosaurs because I'll see whatever we'll go to a museum i'm like this is fake news this is the nephilim or whatever you know i put on my conspiracy theory hat is there an explicit catholic teaching about this and this no. is part of my ignorance yeah there isn't so i don't think that the evidence from the fossil record <clears throat> is that great like there just aren't that many but i don't care either way because the church doesn't teach how old the earth is it doesn't mm. say whether or not the body of man evolved from the animal kingdom. It says maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Uh, we can prove for certain, just philosophically, that our intellect, our free will, like the spiritual part of us, that in principle can't be explained in terms of matter. So it clearly didn't evolve from matter because evolution is a purely material process. So that's the extent of church teaching, which is that you have a spiritual component to you, a.k.a. the image of God that is created yeah. directly. Most theologians say at the moment of conception and that explains the fact that you can understand um, necessary truths like one plus one equals two in all possible worlds, even beyond our material world or if there'd never been any worlds that exist at all. We know that that is just a necessary truth. Uh, we can understand other abstractions like uh, the concept of a, a circle, even though no perfect circles exist in the material world. So these are all indications that our minds go beyond matter. We have free will as well, which means that we're not purely material because matter either behaves in a deterministic way according to the laws of physics or it is um, stochastic, i.e. random. But our choices are neither determined nor random. It's a third kind of thing, a, a rational action. So you don't need to worry too much about evolution. Um, if it did happen, it doesn't contradict anything about what the church teaches. And who knows? Maybe the idea that man is formed from slime is like a figurative way of hinting at the fact that there was some kind of material evolution involved in the formation of the body. I honestly don't know. Uh, I know Tim Gordon doesn't care either way um, or about the age of the earth either way. And guys who get really bogged down in that debate, you're majoring in the minors there. There's just no need to. There are far more important things to make a stand on and to devote your time and energy to. Right. That's one of the objections I hear to like the faith is like, well, don't you know the world is X, X amount of years old and these fossil records? And I don't really know how to combat that argument. Because there's no explicit teaching. The Bible is not clear on that. The Catholic Church is not super clear on that. And so I immediately go, because I'm a bit of a conspiracy theorist, I'm like, yeah, these, this is all fake. And it's meant to draw us away from God and into thinking that we came from, we're, you know, mind, you know mindless and meaningless, um, you know, specks of protoplasm just like smashing together in real time. Yeah. So, I mean, we have this conversation and she's like, well, what do you think? I'm like, I don't know what I think. And to your point as well, too, I don't care that much either. I don't think it's that important of a conversation, but um, it's it's a difficult one. Could it be <laughs> falsified to turn away man from God? I can't believe we're talking about dinosaurs here, but I had to ask this question. Yeah, well, um, the, the let's say in principle that dinosaurs existed. The the Catholic Church doesn't have any problem with that and doesn't see any contradiction with 
anything in the Bible. So yeah, right. Catholics are free to believe in them. Like I said, I don't think the evidence from the fossil record is that amazing. So I'm not personally taking a strong view on it either way. But the, the point is that it's really a question about evolution and the age of the earth. And the church says that uh, you are free to believe um, either way and hasn't taken a stance on the matter. And the Bible doesn't even say how old the age of the earth is because we don't need to know that for the salvation of our souls. That's a very well said. Karen, I hope that that helps you. <laughs> uh, I, I just tell my son, we, we just look at a lot of dinosaurs as being like almost comic book characters because so much of it is just the invention, like the artist's impression of what it might have looked at. So we watch cartoons totally. and stuff and just enjoy all the different characters like the T-Rex and whatever. You know, who, who knows if it was actually real and looked just like that or not. I think he's pretty cool as a character T-Rex. My son loves him. So um, so uh, I agree. <laughs> That was my favorite dinosaur growing up. <laughs> <laughs> How do we lead? He's like the opposite of you, though, Mike. You're a really good deadlifter. T-Rex can't deadlift at all. He's a, it, It's because I have long arms and I suck at bench press. I'm like, man, I wish I had those T-Rex <laughs> arms. <laughs> uh, how do we lead our girlfriends through anxiety over the future into proposing marrying? I have been dating for four months and it's going well, but she's still unsure over her future. So is she unsure about being with you or about being married or is she uncertain about your current commitment because you're not married? What do you, what, what context do you get from this? Will? I'm not, I feel like there's not enough here. It looks to me like she's not sure whether she wants to get married. Then in which case it's sorry. Then, yeah. In that case, it, let's just pretend it's that if she's unsure, she wants to uh, get married. Uh, you're not going to make it, bro. I would, I would end it. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, I think a woman pretty much knows straight away unless you end up becoming like a tyrannical abuser that she wants to marry you. My wife was enthused from the beginning to want to marry me. So I would walk away. You, how is this going to withstand the, the, the length and test of time if she's unsure after four months? Yeah, I was thinking <clears throat> if four, four months isn't enough, um, how long is it going to be enough? In principle, you can always say I need more time. And at some point, people just need to accept that any big decision like that is going to involve an element of nerves. And you just have to commit to it uh, regardless. All right. Next question. We've got, uh, do we speak too much in absolutes in terms of men, women, and the individual personality nuances make this sometimes unhelpful roles, responsibilities. So yes, there are these individual nuances and, 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 and traits that, you know, men and women can exhibit that maybe is for a man, a feminine behavior for a woman, a masculine behavior. Um, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that we should not be, or takes away from the fact that we should be speaking absolutes. We're designed differently with different purposes in mind. And I think that enough is to say that we should be and continue to do so. Yeah, exactly. So the husband is always going to be the head of the wife. Like you can't say, well, because of our, um, our individual personality nuances, I feel like actually my wife is the head of the family. So there are absolutes there in terms of the way the family is supposed to function. So that's why we speak in those terms. And the different um, the inclinations of men and women are ordered towards those different roles within the family. And a lot of times this idea of it not being the man's personality to be a leader is just cope for the fact that actually he needs to work harder on his defects and improve as a man to be able to fully step into that role. And the same thing happens the other way, right? With a woman who just says like, well, I feel like I'm just naturally not submissive. Yeah, well, you're just you, 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 you're having this you're living the spirit of Eve out in real life. It's, it's rebellion, right? Mm -hmm. Um I think, mm -hmm. yeah, you could you could say that. But just like you said, for a woman, it's cope. That means you need to learn um, uh, the, the virtues of of temperance, restraint, kindness, um, you know, generosity, submissiveness, obedience, um, because your flesh is telling you and your flesh is weak and your spirit is willing. And um, I think you just need more uh, <laughs> self-development. No different than how you were saying with the man. Yeah, I'm not naturally a leader. 
Okay, well, then you need to work on that because what else are you going to be for your family? You can't yeah. be anything but that. And if you're like a hardened masculine woman, well, that's just the way that I am. No, you're just kind of a, you're a contentious person and you have a, you lack fundamental self-awareness. Yeah, I agree. All right. Last question. While dating, physical boundaries or what? Does this change you all after engagement? This one is super easy to answer. Um, don't do anything that you wouldn't do in front of witnesses in public. That if you just bear that rule in mind, then you're never going to get yourselves into trouble by getting heated and pushing things too far. And some people might not be able to follow that unless they literally have people around them. So minimizing one-on-one -on -one special alone time is going to eliminate those occasions of sin. And that holds for even after engagement too, right the way up until marriage. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, that's the first thing I tell guys that are in this kind of courtship period is try to really seriously minimize uh, how often you're alone. Um, in terms of physical touch, I think a lot of guys overthink this. Don't make out with her because you know what's going to happen. <laughs> she, You are going to be tempted. And if you're expecting her to uphold chastity, then you failed as a leader because a, a, a woman will naturally go that way, at least most women. Um, so holding hands and giving a, a peck on the cheek or the lips here and there, I don't think you're, you're in sexual sin for doing that. Um, just be really, really, really be mindful. Mm -hmm. Just like Will said, that's a really good answer, man. I'm going to have to steal that. Uh, don't do anything that you wouldn't do in front of witnesses. That's a perfect answer. Yeah, right. You wouldn't make out from people, so don't do that. Yeah, you could give her a light kiss on the lips, but you're not going to get all hot and heavy in front of her parents, right? So <laughs> just uh, hold to that principle and you'll be fine. All right. Thanks for the questions. Hope everyone got a good answer. I think we got through all of them. Mike, pleasure to speak with you as always. Looking forward to always next fun. week. Have a great day, man. Take care. You too, brother. All the best, man. God bless. Bye.